All right, we are here with Sebastian Marino. He is the Senior VP of BlackBerry OS. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Great to be here. Excellent. So uh, you were with QNX even before it was acquired uh, by RIM. Yep. Uh, can you tell us how the, you know, the journey of being acquired and, and then beginning on to BlackBerry operating system? Yeah, sure. So I've been with QNX for 14 years now. Uh, in, uh, in engineering, and uh, 2010, we uh, you know we joined RIM. That was in uh, was announced in April 2010, and it was really an interesting journey, uh, an interesting marriage <coughs> between QNX as a new operating system or new core for you know RIM's future platform, and then taking all of the RIM technologies and uh, really building up an entirely new mobile platform. So the journey started with Playbook, and uh, it's continuing today with uh, obviously with BlackBerry. Very nice. And yeah, QNX has you know, a long history of being scalable for multiple things, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, I can give you some examples. In fact, we've been in the embedded business for 30 years, and we, really, we, we have this DNA where we can go and embed the operating system in a variety of different hardware, form factors, and kind of footprints. Mm -hmm. It goes from like low-end, uh, like the low-end remote control, all the way up to high-end routers, like the core of the internet, the biggest Cisco routers in the world, all run QNX and these huge multi-processing systems. Excellent. And uh, obviously, Thorsten Hines has, you know, continued to say that it's not just a mobile platform, or I mean, it's it's more of a a, a universal kind of platform. Um, I guess, how are you guys focusing on uh, being able to adapt to? Not just mobile, but all kind of. Uh, obviously, we see the car too. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so the really interesting thing is we've we've been in the software platform and licensing business forever. That was really Qnix's core business. Right. Um, and the interesting thing with BlackBerry Ten is we now have like just other pieces of the technology stack that we can take out to those markets. So effectively, we can take like a good example is the web browser, mm -hmm. right? The Torch WebKit engine, yes. which. In automotive, we didn't have a browser before. Car manufacturers would, you know, develop their own. Now we can take that web engine and have it as part of our stack that we license in automotive. So in some ways, we're taking BlackBerry 10 and saying, how do we adapt it for different verticals? And we have, we're able to provide a complete stack in those verticals instead of just providing nice. kind of the base platform without the, the UI. So that's actually really exciting. Yeah, excellent. So for the future of automotive, uh, for example, I have a car that runs on OnStar, and I know that's QMX, but will the future be more BlackBerry 10, like with embedded systems, like how we see on the Porsche model, where that will be actually BlackBerry displays running a more BlackBerry 10 OS instead of core QNX or not? Uh, so I think what you're going to see, and, and you see this with Car2, you guys have obviously done your research and you've looked into Car2, really what we provide to the automotive industry is you know, Car2, which is kind of a derivative of BlackBerry 10 um, as a reference. And then they take that and they change. They typically would, would have a different hardware form factor and a different user interface. Right? So I'm not sure that they would take, like they couldn't actually take a tablet and put that in the center console as is. It would be different hardware, <coughs> but it could still be the same type of display. And they would typically change the user interface. They would say, here's a GM or here's an Audi or right. BMW or Toyota. They all have their different uh, different user interfaces. But like an application made for, for example, say a, 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 navi a navigation application, it could work on BlackBerry 10 phones and it could work on an embedded system or not? So actually the thing that we're doing, so it's a very, very good question. So the thing that we're doing with, uh, with the automotive industry, this is very timely, um, is the automotive industry recognizes that if you want to get applications in a car, which is really what you're talking about, it can't be a closed system, right? You really need to build open systems where they can say, hey, if you have a mobile application, it's very easy for you to bring it into the car. And by the way, you don't have to redo it 50 times for every car model. If you do it once, it can run across the entire industry. So what the, the industry has been doing, or, or many of the players in the industry have been doing, is really to look at the, the right technology for interoperability is HTML5. And so the industry is standardizing around, if you build an application in HTML5, then you can target it. You can take your mobile code base. You may have to change the user interface for automotive, but you can target it. <coughs> At automotive, and then there's also work that's going around, uh, going on around extending the HTML5 standard for automotive-specific extensions. Like for example, if I built an app, how do I tell the app that the car right now is moving, like I'm driving, and so it's not allowed to, you know, it's not allowed to show me a list and let me scroll through my friends and start typing SMSs in the car. Um, 
but it will take a, you know, it, it, it allows voice input, for example. Right? So having these, having the, basically the standard provide a, a way for the applications to know that so they can change, they can adapt, and instantiate themselves properly depending on the environment. Or if I'm running in a BMW versus, uh, you know, a GM, the way that I interface with the app may be different. Like one may have, you know, a, like a wheel to interact with right, the app right, versus right. the other one may be pure voice <coughs> or touch screen. Touch screen. Yeah. Right? So again, the industry is standardizing those things in, this, in, in HTML5 so that you can, as a developer, build your app once and then deploy it across the industry. That's cool. So that's really actually really exciting. So it's not exactly the same app, but it's mostly the same code base. Nice. Okay. And going into the future, I mean, you, you have... Uh, we started out with uh, QNX and developed BlackBerry 10 from that. Um, is BlackBerry 10 sort of the next generation of this uh, QNX operating system, um, or is it just something that diverged from it? Uh, will we see, say, BlackBerry 10 um, generalized to things like cars and other electronics, or will it just be QNX? Um, just no, sure. So I think what you're going to see is um, it's kind of a mix. Okay. Because the BlackBerry 10 stack, as you see it in a, in a handset, is there's a portion that's generic, the platform, and then there's things that are very specific to, to a cell phone. Right? Like the phone app is a good example. On the other hand, a lot of the, the core platform is actually the same in a car as it is in a phone, as it would be in a TV, as it would be in a home panel or a medical tablet, and so on. And so I think you can think of BlackBerry 10 as being a platform that can be, like we can slice it differently depending on the market that we're going into, but the okay. core pieces are all the same, right? It's really, truly a, a nice. platform. Okay, so it's just, yeah, it's more of the yeah, exact Like the same platform. web engine would run in the car and on a cell phone, since we're talking about web. Uh, but the applications that you would build on top of it might be different. Okay. And the user interface, like the home screen, might be different. Okay. And speaking of uh, the user interface, uh, how did you guys go about determining that what we see today is the right, uh, the right user interface? Obviously, we see the peak which yeah. is a really unique feature. and uh... It was a very iterative process, and I think you, know, you see a lot of elements that were in Playbook that are brought forward on BlackBerry 10. Um, and uh, you know, Don Lindsay talked about it in the keynote this morning. It was really around you know, thinking of what's the next gen, like what's the paradigm that is really around productivity and flow mm -hmm. that uh, really solves the in and out problem. I think this was one of the fundamental things that we wanted to do was have this tight integration between applications and between your, kind of your inbox for your hub um, that would tie everything together and then what are the, the, you know, the simple gestures that allow you to navigate through and we did go through you know, on, honestly multiple iterations of it until we came to this uh, kind of this, this end state yeah. um, but it's a, it's a very creative process and it's one that uh, you know, there's also I think a lot of room for innovation right? what we've done is very different from what Apple and Android right. have done and that's Definitely, yeah. That's actually, I, I think it's one of the key things in uh, yeah. key innovations in BlackBerry 10. Certainly is. And so we will not see too much of a, uh, uh, I guess for uh, obviously like a, a QWERTY device um, where it's a smaller uh, real screen real estate. Uh, that same type of BlackBerry Peak features, all that, that those will not be compromised in any way. That's right. the same experience yes. across the board. So really, we're building a we're building a consistent experience across the board. Obviously, with a keyboard device, you know, there's some differences in the experience, but again, you, we don't want to fragment the experience. Exactly. Right? Yeah. The core concepts are the same across all products. Excellent. Okay. When we're talking about BlackBerry OS, I mean, I know you made the uh, distinction between app de um, developing on apps and support for that, and then just the actual platform. Right. Uh, do you deal with the native apps and native extensions and things like that? Or is that more for uh, no? Absolutely. Side? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have specific questions on that, or yeah, sort of like what kind of native extensions um, can we expect, or I'm not sure if you can comment on those. But. Well, I mean, I think you see a lot. Actually, if, you know, if, if you've been looking at the evolution of the Dev Alpha and the, the builds that we've been providing, so what you're getting today has you know a lot more APIs than you, we had uh, you know when we originally released. We're continuing down that path, so I think you can you can kind of see where we're going, right? It's around how we integrate flow and peak and allow applications to take advantage of it, how we allow um, access to all the underlying services, right? So around, you know, we talk about all the connectivity subsystems around uh, the databases for PIM integration, <coughs> social integration, BBM, and so on. That's going to continue. Um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you. <laughs> what else I'd love to tell you. Not but much. Yeah. Not much? Okay. <laughs> But, uh, but it's a big point of focus, right? Because, so one of the key things that we're doing here again in BlackBerry 10 is 
whatever we can bake into our apps, third-party developers should be able to do the same. Okay. Nice. Right. So all of the core functionality and APIs that we're building, that we're using to build <coughs> the core experience, is available to third-party developers. Excellent. And so can you tell us a little more about uh, uh, going from a corporate environment uh, to the personal environment? That was a really great uh, feature of how mm -hmm. a user can it would just change everything, the wallpaper, mm -hmm. right, and all those kind of things. Um, so can you tell us how, how does that work exactly? How does it, it change all the settings without still compromising any type of the security? Yeah, so, so, so effectively the way that it works is you have, we call them perimeters. Um, you basically have two perimeters on the device, which are really two, we kind of segregate the uh, personal applications from corporate applications. The corporate applications go on diff this different area in the file system that's all encrypted. Mm -hmm. And they basically have their own settings, their own data. When they run, they're basically partitioned off from the consumer applications. Um, it even goes down to, like, they may actually use a different network pipe okay. from a personal application. So, for example, a corporate application may be forced to go over VPN to the enterprise, right. whereas the personal app can go over, you know, Starbucks Wi-Fi. <coughs> yeah. um, so, but, but the, the magical thing is it's, those, it's, it's like containers within which these applications run. So we're not changing the applications. It's the same application whether it runs personal or corporate. I see. What we're doing is we're basically running it in a different environment. container or environment. Yeah. Right? So it's kind of an environment that surrounds the applications without having to change the apps. So Thanks. the good thing for, for the user is it's, the app is identical. Yeah. Um, it may behave differently, like if it's App World running against the, you know, the corporate App World store, they're going to see different apps from mm -hmm. regular App World, but it's the same app. Um, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Okay. Also, I have a question on, this is a little more technical. I know in QNX it's very, you know, about symmetric multi-processing, and that's sure. what you advertise as uh, for BlackBerry 10. And, um, Really, um, how does that affect battery life? Does it is it better than um, what we we're used to before? Because I know it's important for BlackBerry users having better battery life. I mean, is is it more efficient? Uh, is it not? How do you do? How do you manage that with all the okay. peak? And yeah, so that's a good question. So the way so the way that multi -pro so you know multi processing has been in Qnix for actually well over a decade now, mm -hmm. um, and that we were we were ahead of our time. Mm -hmm. The um, so the way that it works is basically we do two things around the processor, whether we turn on the second core and also the frequency at which the processor runs. We call that DVFS, variable frequency. And the operating system looks at the load, like what is running, what is the, like what we predict the load to be, right? how many things are actually trying to run simultaneously, and then we're going to you know, crank up the frequency of the cores and or turn on the second core. Now it turns on that in practice, you very rarely run with both cores at full speed. Even though we say we have you know, all this horsepower available with two cores, as you're using the device, very rarely do you actually need to use it. Like when you launch an application, or perhaps if you're doing something like gaming that's very compute intensive, you may, you may need both cores. But in general, you're going to be running the second core for only a, frax, a fraction of the, of the time. So in terms of power consumption, it's, really le it's more about how quickly you can bring up the second core to give you that boost when you need it. Okay. than the true battery impact. Okay. Uh, but I think that like the key thing again is if you build efficient <coughs> software, you rarely are going to need both cores all the time. You'll need it for kind of these peak peak loads. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. And we have a lot of cool tools that let, let us analyze that and let you know developers analyze that to see how things are, are running and when they need the, the horsepower. Okay. So just like just the closing statement and stuff. Um, I was trying to explain to my youngest sister like what QNX was, and she's very young, so she was like not understanding. So she, her reaction was like, "Will I able to? Will I be able to take my phone, go in the car? You know, the song that's playing on my phone all of a sudden in the car, and then when I go home, to be able to use something like NFC to open my door, or you know, turn on the lights or something like that? Like, do you expect this software, whether it be branded as BlackBerry 10 or even QNX, to be embedded all over, or or?" You know, you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, absolutely. So what is the vision of the future? Actually, it's a, that's, a really good, that's a really good point. Actually, I did a talk on that last Friday at the uh, Mobilize conference. I think the vision of the future is really that, you know, the inter interconnected, ubiquitous computing, all those things that you describe and more, that's what computers should do for us, right? It should be completely magical. Even, <laughs> you shouldn't even need NFC when you get into your home, right? It should just know that it's you at your home and do things automatically for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the future, and I think we're going to be a, a key part of it. 
Um, one of the, I think one of the biggest ingredients in achieving that future is actually how we allow all these systems to interoperate. So really we need different <coughs> standards to interoperate between all these different domains and industries to let us do all these magical things. That's where like the automotive example is a good one of like picking a standard that allows us to go from mobile to the car and build application that bridges across these two domains. Like we need to do the same thing for how you share data, how you, you know, how you share location and so on to get that seamless experience. But it's going to happen, there's no question about it. Awesome. awesome. Very good. Well thank you Sebastian, we appreciate well, your thank time. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks. Thank you.